Uh, professor Barry is uh, she's a professor in the medical school here. So she's also the director for the Center of Innovation in Global Health at Stanford, as well as the Senior Associate Dean of Global Health for Stanford University. Um, and even oh, it's very recently this week, uh, I think she was elected to the American <laughs> Association for the Investment of Science. So congratulations, and we're very happy to have you to join us here. Uh, she will tell us about actually different policy lessons learned from global response. Um, thank you, Dr. Zhao. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about lessons learned from the global response uh, of COVID-19. And what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time just going over some probably definitions for you that you already know, but bear with me. Um, I just want to remind people that um, this a pandemic is caused by a coronavirus, and there are many thousands of coronaviruses, but only seven of them infect humans, of which four cause the common cold. One is the first one that we saw that was a spillover from a zoonotic setting, a bat, was SARS-CoV-1, which caused severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2002 through 2004, and infected 8,000 people had a very high mortality, higher than the mortality we're seeing here, um, in 32 countries and in three months, and then suddenly, mysteriously disappeared. And we can talk about that later. mers cov um, is a, another coronavirus that is still with us and is endemic. When I say endemic, it's in low levels. Um, we've seen about 2,500 cases. Um, over the last, I would say it was identified about five years ago um, with a 35% mortality. And really most of it's focused in Saudi Arabia. There's been a little pop-up in other countries and it's felt to be, have an amplifier animal, which is a bat, uh, which is a camel. So it went from bats to camels to humans. SARS-CoV-1 was felt to be the civet cat, um, which was an amplifier um, animal. Um, which becomes interesting because we're starting to see um, COVID-19 or what is also known as SARS-CoV-2 uh, infecting cats. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the recent reports of the tigers and zoos and kittens um, that are being infected by SARS-CoV-2. But this too is also a coronavirus that is found in a bat, um, may have an amplifier animal. We don't know, it, you, it was postulated it was a pangolin um, pangolins being an animal that is, are the most trafficked animals in the world because the Chinese um, believe it has med, med, its scales have medicinal properties. Um, but again, the homology between the pangolin coronavirus um, and the one that we're seeing in humans is only about 90%. So that probably is not the amplifier um, virus. So I just want to step back and talk a little bit about public health because I can't give a lecture uh, without talking about public health. And I, you know, we're we're all under quarantine now, um, and I just want to give you the history of what that comes from. It comes from the word quaranta giorno, uh, which is the 40 days that a ship was needed to anchor in Venice during the uh, Black Death or the plague, which killed about 30 to 50 percent um, of of the world. Um, we then went on to the quarantine law of 1878, um, which prevented in the US the introduction of yellow fever, cholera, and smallpox, what were felt to be the big three um, infectious diseases at that time. And since 1982, um, our list of quarantinable diseases, um, and that means that the federal government has a right to um, mandate that you stay quarantined, are cholera, diphtheria, yellow fever, smallpox plague, TB, any of the acute respiratory syndromes, hemorrhagic viruses, and what we um, have seen rarely, but unfortunately, um, we always worry about it, and that's the flu viruses that cause pandemic, not epidemic, but pandemics. Um, so, and the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is a pandemic has to have sustained transmission through many continents and not just geographically in one area, which could be considered an epidemic. So just the history of um, international health regulations, really 
um, the WHO, which uh, unfortunately has been recently attacked, um, really is our only sense of global governance right now. And that was started in 1948. Um, and the WHO created the International Sanitary Regulations, um, the authority to adapt sanitary and quarantine regulations in 51. And then after SARS won, they actually uh, decided that they um, revised the IHR to have regulations to include outbreaks of what they are calling public health emergencies of international concern, other than the big three diseases that I told you about. Um, and this IHR regulations ask countries to detect and respond to disease, of which WHO then could call a PHEIC and ask other member states to give money and to cooperate to control um, what they would call a public health emergency of international concern. And there was, there continues to be criticism of Dr. Tedros that he, he took a little bit of a time um, to call a PHEIC for this outbreak. And we can talk about that maybe in the Q&A. So what I'd like to spend my time talking about is um, why we are on such an amazing curve and what are we doing wrong that countries like Singapore, well, I'd like to focus on four countries, well, three countries and a territory that have done really well um, at controlling uh, COVID-19. And that is South Korea, China, Singapore, and the territory, Hong Kong. Um, and the reason why these countries, you would have thought, would have been hit really hard is that about 5 million people traveled from Wuhan before the lockdown um, came around the city of Wuhan. And they traveled mostly to these four countries. So they had a vulnerability due to the proximity to the initial outbreak. So what did they do right? Well, Singapore immediately um, developed strict international, um, strict international, oops, sorry, ah, travel restrictions and asked people to stay at home for 14 days and did aggressive uh, temperature um, screening borders. In fact, you cannot go into, I'm sorry, this keeps going on and off. You cannot go into an area of, um, can you see my, everything okay? Yes, we can see. Okay, sorry. I don't know why, my, sorry. You cannot go into an area, uh, you cannot come into uh, Singapore without being restricted at home uh, for 14 days. Now, admittedly, the population of Singapore is only 5.8 5 million, but it was the first country to have confirmed cases outside of China. Um, and they have really um, managed to, by high levels of testing, lax testing requirements, anybody can get tested if you have any kind of question of whether you've been exposed. And they, at their peak, they did about 2,000 tests a day. Um, they gave stay-at-home notices for everyone who was a contact or travel and had four masks delivered to every single person in the country. So what happened when, if you got a stay-at-home um, uh, notice? Well, what happened is the authorities would give you text messages uh, sent to you at various days, and you would have to give an update on your location with the GPS on your mobile phone. You would get random phone calls and house visits from authorities. And if you got a phone call, you have to take photos of your surroundings and give the GPS um, statistics. So essentially, it was GPS quarantine surveillance, um, which the Ministry of Health and the police enforced with fines. Um, and really, you could not go, you can't, you still to this day cannot go into a building in Singapore without having thermal uh, testing in all public spaces. Unfortunately, Michelle, we have a question. Yeah. You want to stop me for questions? Or not, do you want to ask? Hi, yeah. Uh, maybe you could take this question whenever it's most appropriate. But I was going to ask, uh, is, could widespread testing be a problem because of false positives, uh, especially if the disease is not yet prevalent in a new area? I would not be worried about widespread false positives because that just would give people the information to quarantine themselves for 14 days. What I worry about in testing is widespread false negatives, 
um, and we can talk a little bit about that. The testing here developed at Stanford has about a 99% um, sensitivity and specificity with very little false negatives. And it's the false negatives that give people a feeling of confidence uh, to go out there. Thank you. So, did I answer your question? Yes, thanks. Okay, so the COVID-19 in Singapore, which was in single digit cases, I mean, it looks like this is a big curve, but if you see it's like five cases, six cases, seven cases, um, all of a sudden recently has surged. And it's recently surged amongst Singapore's migrant workers. Uh, and these are workers that are um, housed in very high density housing. And I think that, that high, this, this concept of high density, and I actually think one of the reasons why we've done so well in the Bay Area is we're not a high dense um, situation, but high density like New York or like migrant workers that are, or refugee camps um, really put people at risk. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about why I think Singapore did so well and continues to do well. They have quarantined, unfortunately, in a very strict way, the migrant workers, but that's, they feel that that's really important. But they have a very unified government with uh, very streamlined um, communications. And you can see every day on your phone, if you have a WhatsApp messaging, you actually get the number of new cases that have been reported, how many have been discharged, how many remain in the hospital. You get a little message about being socially responsible and why that's critical. They send out very, very, the, the, the National University of Singapore, which is a great, it's a great university. I've actually given some lectures there, uh, had, did something called the COVID-19 Chronicles, where they, they sent out messages about how it was critical to have collective uh, community response to this disease. And it wasn't a one for one and just about me. It was really about the collective um, responsibility of a community. They also developed a fabulous app, which is being used around the world called Trace Together. Um, and this is a cell phone app, which allowed Bluetooth networks. Uh, if you were COVID positive, you were entered into anonymously into the phone app and people would get pings uh, if they were within the uh, six feet. They calculated the distance between people um, who were positive for 21 days. If you were a contact for 21 days, your uh, GPS coordinates, if you were close to somebody, would ping that cell phone. So it allowed early notification of exposure to a COVID-19 positive person. And even though this was not a mandated app, it was installed by more than 620,000 people. Um, and it's now freely available to developers around the world. And this let the Minister of Health become better informed about who needed quarantine. Now, obviously the con is privacy, because uh, if you're ping that it's somebody three feet within you, you obviously can see um, who is positive. But this is all, people wanted this. People felt very safe about this. I interviewed uh, several people in Singapore uh, who, and I asked them, what, what were your feelings about this? And this is something that actually folks wanted. Uh, again, selection bias and only a few people and anecdotal. Other high-tech solutions that they used, uh, which I thought were fascinating, were robots like BeamPro, uh, which was used to deliver food, medicine, and supplies to people in isolation in the hospital. This becomes very important. I don't know if any of you saw the articles in the New England Journal, but I'm sure you've seen it in the press, that SARS virus can stay on surfaces for 72 hours and even longer. So that in these rooms, um, healthcare workers are obviously at risk. So the cleaning robots used in hospitals helped to maintain the sanitation standards and lowered the risk to healthcare workers and also conserved PPE. You did not need to use your N95 mask if you were staying outside of the room. And it, it, it dramatically reduced hospital transmission. I'd like to switch now to South Korea, which took a different uh, uh, approach and actually did incredibly rigorous testing. Uh, they mobilized companies, uh, and this is where they worked with the private sector, which we have not done very well. And this is right at the beginning of the epidemic. The prime minister called for rapid, for private sector people to come to their, to the parliament or wherever 
the meeting was and said, would you um, take all of your companies and put them towards making kits? And they did. They made 100,000. They were the first to make the kits. They were the first to start 600 testing centers around the country um, with drive-by, which is what we're using now, drive-by testing. They conducted over 300,000 tests uh, at a peak, 15,000 a day. And this is this is somewhat older slide. I'm sure it's gone up much higher. I want, I want to let you know in a country of 300 million or above, which is what we are, we have only to this day, and I looked it up right before this talk, only tested about 450,000 people. That is really pathetic compared to some of the, our Asian colleagues. So there is more testing per capita than any other country. And I think this was a major way people were isolated, quarantined, and minimized community transmission. And these were all government, government finance testing in centers so that you could get it free. And you know there's been a lot of talk about whether our testing is free. And I happen to know in the UK, I have a very good friend who's a dean at a major university who actually was just hospitalized for uh, COVID-19 and could not get a test in the UK. He had to pay out of pocket 150 pounds to get tested um, privately because there was no free testing. So rigorous testing uh, was clearly a way that South Korea held their numbers. Um, but there's been some very disturbing, and South Korea, let me go, let's see if I can go back for a second. Um, it, it, South Korea had a lack of strict lockdown. They did not even stop uh, restaurants. They did not stop uh, gatherings of, they, they allowed gatherings of four people. They only closed um, schools. And um, so they were managed to keep this epidemic at a low. They did a very advanced contact tracing using big data with security cameras and smartphone apps and credit cards. They made this data transparent and available to the public uh, so that you knew where your hotspots were in a neighborhood. Um, they had regular text messages to at-risk communities. And the, again, aggressive thermal in imaging with daily press briefings and new laws um, to prioritize community security. And to this day, they have not had a strict um, uh, lockdown. What has happened, and because they've done such rigorous testing, um, they are beginning to find, this is one very disturbing report. It's not peer reviewed guys, so don't get crazy yet. It's only 163 people um, who recovered from COVID-19, and they are now testing positive again in South Korea, some with mild illness. Uh, these are very low, 2.5%. And the question is, why do you have a negative test and then become positive again? And so there are four, in my mind, there are four reasons. One is that the reverse transcriptase, the, R, the PCR tests used may still be picking up parts of RNA um, that a person has recovered, after the person has recovered, that are not infectious. We know that, for instance, I work with Ebola. We know that Ebola can often, um, uh, you can secrete our RNA parts of the phylovirus for many, many, many months, up to a year, and it's not necessarily infectious. So that could be one aspect. Two, it, it could be an error with the negative test. Um, or, or an error with a false positive in the second one. Or three, the virus could be reactivated. We know many viruses like um, EBV, Epstein-Barr virus or mono, um, can be reactivated after being dormant, or herpes virus we know can be reactivated. Or I, I doubt that, because those are usually DNA viruses and this is an RNA virus. Or it could be true reinfection, indicating that we have no immunity after an infection. And I, I think this is less likely because I think we'd be seeing more of this. Um, so I'm hoping the reason for this is either one or two of the issues that I spoke about earlier. So um, as I said, we talked about high surveillance, quarantine, uh, and community communication. Oops, sorry. And now I want to turn to China. I like this picture. This is a picture of Wuhan. Doesn't it look like, to me, it looks like the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, but it's actually not. It's a picture in Wuhan. Um, and this is the, the epicenter, the beginning of the um, epidemic, which is felt to have started in a wet market. 
which is a live animal market in uh, Hubei province in Wuhan. And they did a very bold and aggressive approach that really only China can do, I think, that changed the course of the rapidly escalating pandemic dramatically. They did- Michelle, we have yeah. a, before we move to Wuhan, we have a couple of questions about South Korea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Adi? Yeah, I was curious whether the people who are testing positive again are also getting antibody tests rather than just the RT-PCR tests and whether this means that they have what we're conceptualizing as immunity in the form of antibodies or not. Um, so this is only a preliminary report. We have not seen the full, um, uh, the full splay of immunity testing. So I can't answer that question. We're all waiting with bated breath. This is really hot off the presses. Um, we're all waiting for bated breath, with bated breath to see if they're IgG and IgM positive. But they, these are with PCR. Okay, thank you so much. Those swaps. Great, Chelsea? Um, if, there, if people aren't developing immunity after being infected or some people, does that mean like a vaccine might not be effective for everyone? Yeah, that's what we're worried about, yes. That's exactly what we're worried about. I, again, I am hoping that it's just pieces of RNA that they're detecting in the nasal swabs and we're waiting to see. We don't know yet whether the IgG confers immunity. We're all hoping it confers immunity, um, but as you know, uh, some of the coronaviruses like the common cold, we don't get a whole lot of long-term immunity from. You've also got but, one last question. But on the, on the positive side, uh, MERS gives you immunity and SARS-1 gave you immunity. So again, we're all hoping that that's true. It was short term. SARS-1 was only one to two years that you had IgG and MERS um, actually was a longer time. Can I go on? Uh, we have one last question from Kunal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looked like there were only about 200 deaths out of 8,000 infections, which seems like a death rate that's much lower than anywhere else in the world. Uh, is there an explanation for that? Um, I will get to that because the country that has the lowest fatality rate is Germany. And uh, can you wait a few seconds so I have an explanation for that, okay? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Um, so China's strategy was, as I said, strict um, authoritarian control of movement via quarantine and social distancing. Uh, as the Chinese are amazing at doing, they, they sent out 40,000 healthcare workers to Wuhan um, with 1,500 epidemiologists so that you could have five epidemiologists tracing each case, which you can imagine how well it, you, one could do isolation and quarantine. Um, and they expanded hospital infrastructure. They built, they built a hospital in 10 days, one hospital, um, and they did many other, three new hospitals, 16 temporary, and swift testing development. Um, and we know that Wuhan's lockdown uh, has been lifted. They've had no cases within two weeks, uh, but people are still being urged to stay home. Um, they're using public transportation now. You can see the picture on the left. Um, they are still in masks. Uh, now, you've heard a lot of criticism about China, and we can talk about that in Q&A. It's clear that their death rate uh, was not initially reported as correct. Um, but in my mind, uh, I think they were very transparent about uh, giving the genome very quickly to WHO and giving testing kits very quickly when they figured, when they realized they had a really huge problem. Um, but there are growing calls for China's accountability for the COVID-19 response, um, as I'm sure you've been reading in the papers. They used many high-tech solutions. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting that they used drones for crowd and temperaturing uh, monitoring, where the drones would sense temperatures in a crowd and alerted officials to uh, take that person out and get them tested. Um, but with the drones, people were, the police were able to enforce the strict social distancing measures and, monitoring, and monitor fevers. Hong Kong is another, and I have to tell you, initially when China uh, broke out, I thought, oh my God, this is going to be, and Hong Kong didn't close the borders that quickly. Uh, I thought this is going to be a disaster for a small island. 
um, but actually they did fabulously. Um, and they, they implemented very strict social distancing uh, very early. Uh, they had closure of schools, businesses, and amusement parks, the areas that were large gatherings, but they kept their restaurants open. Uh, they, they allowed people to um, have gatherings of four. Um, they did give anyone who came from a foreign country how to get a wristband, um, and, and it was a stay home safe app that the wristband connected to for tracking those in quarantine and making sure that they were in quarantine. Every day they had public sharing of information uh, with how many cases, how many deaths, how many discharged. Um, they did give, uh, which pros and cons, you can see that little map with the hot red spots of, of they, they actually told people which buildings cases resided in, the date of positivity, their symptoms, their street location, and the date of discharge. So people knew where there were hot spots um, within the territory. So, uh, but why, why did these four um, uh, Asian, why did these three countries in the territory do so well? Well, I, my hypothesis is one, they, these were all four um, uh, countries and territories that had extensive preparation for the, they went through the SARS-1 outbreak. So they already had this concept of social distancing, uh, this philosophy of collective protection. Um, they, they had fever clinics set up. Uh, they did something very, I thought very smart early on. They did not let positive people go back into the house they isolated anybody that was positive out of the family. And when, especially when China realized that 80% of their transmission was in family of COVID positive people that they left within the family. It's very hard when you have a virus that stays on surfaces to be able to truly isolate someone within a, in a family. So they opened up uh, um, tent cities, they hotels and took infected people even mildly a symptom, not mildly, mildly symptomatic people and isolated them from the home. So they did swift and decisive physical distancing, aggressive testing as we talked about, and very, unlike our country, very consistent, not mixed messages, coordinated public health communication. Um, and, 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 and actually very well thought out public communications. I'm just appalled. I don't know if anyone saw this morning uh, that our president has recommended uh, that we inject disinfectants um, or use UV light in our blood. Um, I, it, it, it just boggles my mind that we have a non-scientist uh, giving uh, public health communication uh, and potentially killing people. Uh, this was a very interesting, are there any questions about that because I want to move on to Italy. Good. So this is a public health, you, you know, everybody knows that Italy exploded. Um, why Italy exploded is interesting. It, they exploded in the city of Milan. Turns out Milan, as you know, is the fashion center for Italy. And it turns out that um, this, the sewing industry comes from Wuhan Chinese workers. So there were many Wuhan Chinese that were in Milan. Um, and brought the virus there. Um, but there was a little town called Vo, and the little town Vo, when they had the first death, and they really had Italy's first death, they closed the town's border completely. And it's a small town. Um, you know, they're only about, I forget, like 3,000 people. It's not very many. And they implemented mass testing of all residents. Uh, they found that 3% 3 3 of the residents were testing positive. Um, they did strict quarantine and isolation. And they absolutely stopped um, every single case from happening. Uh, and since 3-8, they really haven't had any positive cases. So I think this is a nice little example of how um, if you did aggressive testing of everyone, even asymptomatics, everyone in your area, and you knew who were positive, you quarantined and isolate, you could actually stop. This is what we call non-pharmaceutical intervention. You may have heard this term, NPI, non-pharmaceutical intervention, can work. Good public health can work. And I give a lot of credit to Sarah Cody, um, who is our commissioner, is a very close friend of mine, uh, for doing shelter at home early uh, in the Bay Area, and particularly in Santa Clara, 
and getting the other commissioners around to actually do shelter at home very early. And I think that's why we're not seeing, we, we haven't seen the surge. Uh, right now at Stanford Hospital, we only have 11 patients that are COVID positive in the hospital with four on ventilators. So we are doing incredibly well with shelter in place. Here's a country where I'd like to think about religion and public health clashing. Um, we saw in South Korea that the original um, epidemic started in a, in a church where you had a mass gathering. In Iran, and I, I don't know if you guys remember, Iran was one of the first countries to take off dramatically. And you could say, why Iran? Well, it turns out there was a, um, a Muslim pilgrimage destination in Qom where people kiss the, they actually kiss or lick, mostly kiss the holy sites. And um, there was massive viral dissemination there. Um, and since then, the sites have been closed, but still angry crowds have broken the barricade. And that's pretty much why um, Iran took off in a, a very dramatic way um, with positive cases. And they're clamping down now with traveling screening and unnecessary travel. Um, and, um, but they are thinking about low risk economic activities to resume 411, which I think is just crazy, but we can talk about that later as well. So somebody asked me, why is it in certain countries that you have a very low death rate? And I think the country that has absolutely the lowest death rate is Germany, uh, where it has 0.7% low fatality rate. Um, in Italy, the CFR or case fatality rate is as high as 11%. So why is that? Well, I think this has a lot to do with demographics. Um, it's a um, younger age. Well, for, first of all, the, the epidemic in Germany started in Austria at a ski resort where young skiers came back to Germany and actually um, passed it amongst their uh, friends. And so the age of patients in Germany is much younger than Italy, average age 49 to 62, with many of them being on the lower age. Uh, they had a very aggressive testing. So when you have a high denominator of negatives and you have a, 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 the same numerator of deaths, you're gonna have a very low case fatality rate. And also they had better adherence to physical distancing, quarantine, and hospital isolation. Um, and I love this concept, they had corona taxis, where the taxis um, actually went to um, uh, patients that had mild cases. And when they got worse, they took them in and isolated them immediately out of the family. Um, they also, um, very early in Italy, because they had that wave um, of very sick patients coming in, they overwhelmed the health facilities. So they had a higher death rate because you, you, if you don't have enough ventilators, you're not uh, going to be able to reverse those very severely ill patients. So I like to think of it, if you think about a certain amount of water coming onto your shore in waves, you're gonna get a certain amount of water. If it comes in waves, you'll be able to cope with it if it comes as a tsunami, the same amount of water can actually do quite a bit of damage. Um, so you overwhelm uh, whatever um, space you have on your island where the tsunami comes. And what happened with Italy is they overwhelmed their, haste, their health facilities. So I think that there, if you look at each country, you'll find that there are um, cultural contexts as well as the way and transmission and age group. And, and the amount of testing um, changes your case fatality rate. But there's no question the case fatality rate is higher in older patients, in patients that have comorbid disease, and strikingly higher in men. Even in Santa Clara Valley, um, we have a 70% death rate in men compared to 30% in women. And that's pretty much the same around the world. And we can talk about what some of the reasons of that are. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm writing a paper now about the gendered lens of COVID-19. So I work mostly in Africa. So I'm sitting and waiting and thinking about this ticking bomb uh, that's happening in Africa. Um, this is the, on the left-hand side, you see the confirmed cases. Um, it's pretty much all over Africa. Um, and again, there are some blank areas, but we're concerned over limited testing availability. Egypt has just um, uh, announced their, their cases. So that's a little bit um, 
you know, this was as of 421, but I've heard of some cases in, Chi in Cairo, so stay, stay tuned for that. But the epicenter, and I'll go back to that, you can see that the epicenter is South Africa. Uh, the brown areas are the areas where we're seeing quite a few cases. And the reason why South Africa worries me um, is it's going to be very hard to socially distance and isolate. And if any of you have visited there, the townships, um, which are the, um, the, the legacy of apartheid, where the very poor patients live, they're kind of the favelas of Africa, are very crowded. Um, remember, we have a lot of HIV and immunocompromised hosts. Proper hand washing is often a difficult to access. Um, I heard an amazing statistic that more people have access to cell phones um, in the world than have access to safe hand washing facilities. Um, there's a lack of testing, PPE, and critical care support. Um, now, South Africa has taken a very tough line, very tough line. They've actually brought out their armed forces to patrol social distances. This is one of the few countries that have done that. There's a nationwide lockdown. Um, they do have the advantage of being a young country. And remember, I said that the uh, case fatality rate is very high in older people, so that they, that's the sort of silver lining that they may be able to survive this better. And they do have a good research infrastructure um, that has been uh, focused on HIV and TB, tuberculosis, now can focus on COVID-19. But there are still major challenges of the basic supplies and access to wash, um, wash being water and sanitary hygiene access. Um, and really only 15% of Sub-Saharan Africans have access to that. They have a lack of soap and running water to prevent disease transmission. Um, and obviously they don't have hand sanitizer or reliable electricity. Um, and forget ventilators. Um, I, I talk to, I work mostly in Zimbabwe, um, and you can see when I talk to my um, uh, counterpart in Zimbabwe, he's, I said, James, aren't you worried about the ventilators? He said, no, Michelle, this is, you know, we, we've not had ventilators for many years and we've had very many sick patients. So this is, this is the way it is. Um, there are less than 2,000 continents, uh, less than 2,000 ventilators um, in, on the continent. There are 10 countries without any. There's a shortage of trained medical personnel to run the ventilators. Um, and I got Anna Crawford, the World Bank called us to see if we could set up critical guidelines and teach people how to use ventilators in Africa. So actually Stanford is running a um, training session on how to run the ventilator correctly because the COVID-19 lung behaves differently um, than a typical pneumonia or ARDS lung. Um, it's a, a very pliable lung. So there are, are specific settings that we need to uh, teach other people by um, really dint of what we've learned. Um, there's unreliable oxygen. Um, if any of you have worked overseas, you know very well that electricity can go out at any one time. Um, there's insufficient data to capture true numbers. Um, and there are very fickle ventilator uh, contracting out and changing prices of who's trying to sell ventilators overseas. And then lastly, the continent has an amazing challenge with the intersecting crises they have. Um, this is, I think, it's a very busy slide of Africa, um, but what it's showing is where the humanitarian crises are, where the yellow fever outbreaks are, the dengue, the leishmaniasis, measles, monkey, monkeypox. It doesn't even have malaria on this. And I, I heard a very disturbing report that we're gonna see tremendous outbreak of malaria because there's really big problems now getting insecticide treating, treated netting. Um, there's nobody, the factories are closed making this. And also anti-malarials, as you know, our president has pushed for one of the anti-malarials to be used. Uh, there's a lot of anti-malarials that are being shunted away from Africa. So they have this intersecting crises um, that they're having to deal with along with COVID-19. So it's really important that uh, we help with capacity building. I know we're uh, very inwardly turned to the United States and taking care of the United States. Um, I, I, to me, this is my calling, is to remind people that we're living on one planet. 
um, that we need to help the weaker infrastructures out there uh, because these diseases spread through countries. They don't know borders. Um, we have to increase laboratory capacity for doing surveillance and diagnostic testing. Um, we need to coordinate medical supplies and PPE um, for many of these struggling countries. Um, and then I, I have some nice little pictures of a snapshot of solutions that friends of mine have sent me. Um, this is on the left of practicing of social distancing in Sudan. Uh, this is a public health demonstration. Uh, this is protective equipment being delivered in Addis Ababa, uh, hand sanitizer at a church in Burkina Faso. Um, and this is a digital strategy team in Benin coordinating social medicine, uh, media and, and you know, luckily, most people in, in Africa have these cell phones with WhatsApp messaging and can be interactive. Uh, we're trying to get increased testing capacity in South Africa, and we're collaborating with our scientific staff. Um, so to end, there's been a very diverse global response to COVID-19. Um, in the United States, um, we've done miserably. Um, there's been some very uh, interesting um, editorials about the demise of US excellence. Um, we have a very broken public health system uh, where we have not a central um, guideline. Even the CDC cannot go into a state unless they're invited. All our public health is state by state. You see New York, you see Cuomo doing a great job, and you see Georgia opening up to massage parlors. How, how close, I mean, you can't get any closer than giving somebody a massage. Um, so we have a very patchwork public health system without a uniform top-down um, uh, coordination. We still have a lack of testing. Modi, to his benefit, realized he had a huge problem. Unfortunately, he, he sort of did it in an implemented fast lockdown and not staged, forcing a massive migration of migrant workers back to rural villages. Um, India is doing much better with strict quarantine and tracing and, and isolating right now. Um, Duarte, we have a crazy guy saying shoot to kill if anyone's in the street for those who evade lockdown. He has very strict lockdown orders. And in Taiwan, I think Taiwan, we didn't talk about Taiwan, but I would say Taiwan is also one of these model countries which has completely flattened the curve with central coordination used big data analytics and new technologies and did very proactive uh, testing in COVID-19. So I, I'd like to end with this concept of what I've written about with Paul Wise, which is interdependent sovereignty. This is this concept that we are not alone. It relates to the ability of countries to control threats that transcend borders. And there are certain threats that we need to be interdependent upon and we need to have shared global governance. And that's air pollution, to give you examples, climate change, and what I would describe as what we're living through now, which is a pandemic infectious disease. So how do we do that? I think the way we do that is to um, think about health in a different way. And this is what I'm trying to build at Stanford and what I'm calling human and planetary health. Um, you may have heard that we just uh, uh, announced a new fellowship, a postdoctoral fellowship in this. And this is this concept of planetary health, which is the impact of land use, deforestation, and climate change upon emerging infectious diseases. Um, we need to have great surveillance to detect emerging zoonotic diseases. All of these pathogens, whether it be Ebola, HIV, um, avian flu, um, MERS are all zoonotic, meaning diseases that have come from animals and spilled over to humans. So we need to keep our animals he healthy and we need to do good surveillance of our animals. And thirdly, besides planetary he health and surveillance, we need to use good science. Um, we need evidence-based interventions to build community resilience, uh, to prevent, adapt, and respond to pandemics. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from, from uh, Chelsea, you wanna go first? 
Um, yeah, I just had a quick question. Your comment that like less than 15% of Sub-Saharan Af Africans have access to hand washing. Are there other ways to clean your hands that maybe we're just not thinking about because we all have access to hand washing here in the U.S.? Soap and water actually works the best. I mean, everybody's obsessed with sanitizers and um, using UV light, but actually simple soap and water works the best. It's the cheapest. Um, you know, I think that's an intriguing question. Um, I don't think like using sand or, but that would be a very, one of the things I'm thinking about is a hackathon to think of unique, innovative ways uh, of uh, dealing with COVID-19. Uh, in particular, I'm, I'm working now with uh, the Justice Brennan Center and some of the Stanford law professors for the November elections and how we can have safe elections um, during the time of COVID-19 if we have to use polling. So it would really be kind of cool to use, to have a hackathon to think about these other areas. But to my knowledge, no, nothing works better than um, washing with soap. Thanks. Great. Daniel? Hi, I'm kind of curious, uh, what are the major limitations currently uh, in, for the U.S. not doing widespread testing and have we tried to source tests from other countries? So, um, you know, we really screwed it up, excuse my language. Uh, the CDC at the beginning refused to get the WHO test. WHO actually, South Korea gave them the test kits, WHO uh, ramped it up and they offered it to CDC and CDC felt, no, we should do our own test. And they rolled out a test in February that was completely wrong. Uh, it had no good control. They had to pull it back. Um, and to this day, uh, that's been a real stain on what I think is, I, I love the CDC. Some of my best friends work in the CDC. They're working their tail off for this epidemic, but that was a mistake. Uh, when they realized that they couldn't ramp up testing, they opened it up to any public health lab in the United States. And if you go to their CDC website, it, you'll see how the ramp up of testing happened with public, when public health labs um, started doing their own testing. My problem with that is there's no quality control. I don't know which tests are good. I know that Stanford test is good because uh, they've done a gold standard testing with it, but I don't know about these other tests. Um, so yes, it would be nice if we had one source of testing that we could um, uh, say is uh, high quality and a negative predictive value. South Korea has shipped us tests. China's tried to ship us tests. There's no question people are trying to help. Uh, I have no, I know that there's been a lot of political um, back and forth about where these tests go. Do the tests go to the red states? Do they go to the blue states? You know, frankly, I don't think health should be political. I don't think health should be partisan. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but the question is, yes, we could take other tests. Okay, but again, you. I think it's a lack of central coordination. Yeah, thank you. Major? And, and actually, I don't know if you guys have heard about the recent test uh, by Iran, Iran Ben David, uh, which did 2,000 tests in the Santa Clara area. It's gotten a lot of criticism because um, he used a Chinese test that we don't know whether how good it was and, not, and how bad it was. So there needs to be some centrally coordinated test that has been validated. Okay. Um, my question is related to basically public kind of knowledge about the disease because the four Asian territories or countries that you talk about, like there is almost unanimous understanding of, you know, the threat of disease. And, but I feel like in the US there has been some sort of a mixed level of understanding about, you know, how serious the case is. And there are demonstrations against lockdowns. Like, could you comment on some of these things? Yes, I can. Um, I can, I mean, but it's all speculative, I, you know, I think we have a legacy of um, independence, uh, independent autonomy, a legacy of federalism, each state out for themselves. Um, and we have a legacy of not very good health literacy. And I think all three of them play into a perfect storm of um, a polarized public and a polarized illiterate public in health literacy. I'm sorry, I, that's kind of, again, my own um, hypothesis. 
uh, other people can chime in. It may not uh, resonate with other people's opinion. And we don't have a sense of collective good for the society. I think we're a very generous nation. Um, we have great, we're probably the most humanitarian uh, donating of all the world, um, but we don't have a good sense of uh, collective civil society, um, which many of the Asian countries do have. And some of the European, many, and particularly the Nordic um, countries, which I didn't even get into the Nordic countries. They have done very well themselves. Sharon? Hi, yes. Um, so I have a quick question kind of along those lines is that even in the more urban areas that are a little bit more accepting of um, preventative measures, um, why are we not doing preventative measures like other countries like Taiwan and Hong Kong have done? Even like it, it feels like even during a stay, um, stay in place, we could do temperature checks at grocery stores and allow a little bit more free flowing population. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that goes back to my slide about our patchwork public health system. We do not have a coordinated public health system which mandates guidelines. Um, there's no question we should be doing thermal imaging. Uh, not everybody has fever that has COVID-19, but a large percentage do. I have no idea why we're not doing it. It took a while for even Stanford Hospital to do it. They're just starting now to do um, thermal che checking when you come into the hospital. How do you we're think, way behind the curve. How do you think we can streamline this education and temperature checks in, in the States? With leadership, please all of you go to, the, go to the polls November 14th. If we had someone like Cuomo that was running our country, we would feel way, way safer and we would have a much better public health system. Mm -hmm. November is kind of I, far away. <laughs> I know. Well, in, I, I always look to impeachment, but I failed with that. <laughs> I, I, I seriously, guys, it's so important for you to vote. Your, your age group does not vote. And it's really important to get this person out of, um, I mean, we really need to have a good public health system and not someone giving us inconsistent messages or telling us to you know, use intravenous disinfectants. Beyond voting in November though, what, is, what are things that we can do earlier on? Well, I think you can volunteer to help. Um, you mean you individually? Yeah. Um, I think there are many th ways students can help. Um, you can participate in some of the research that's going on with COVID-19. I think one of the most striking things for me is the food insecurity uh, that's happening in our own area. I have a very good colleague, Lisa Chamberlain, who told me that every one of her children that came in to be seen in pediatric clinic was hungry. Um, and that has to do with that the second harvest food bank uh, uses, uses volunteers. To, they have enough food, but they use volunteers to distribute the food. And all of those are over the age of 65, so they're not coming in. Um, I think young folks should be all volunteering to do that so people are not hungry. I mean, I think we need to come together as a collective society and make a difference. So volunteer at Second Harvest. Cool, thank you. Feroz? Uh, hi, so I was curious uh, in the slide that you showed at the beginning of Singapore, um, it looks like there's been actually a pretty dramatic resurgence um, yes. in the last uh, I few it, weeks. I think it has to do with they started testing the migrant farm work, uh, not farm workers, sorry. I, I do work on the Mexican border, sorry. The migrant workers in Singapore. That's I see. where the resurgence is. Yeah, they were okay. all crowded in, crowded in dormitories and I don't think they were getting the testing. Okay, okay. Because I think in the press here, people have speculated that, oh, this means that this is kind of, you know, like an ominous omen that no, no. Um, a second wave could we all definitely thought, occur we in all the United States. That. We all thought that. But if you look at where the cases are, they're all in migrant workers. Okay, okay. That's actually in some ways encouraging. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It is. Final? Hey, uh, thanks for taking my third question. Um, so I think the we know this lockdown is going to take a very long time. Uh, and some economic activity may have to resume unless that be revolts. Uh, so what do you think the economic activity that could resume first is? And what do you think the 
conditions that a country needs to meet uh, are in order to be able to uh, resume some form of activity. So I think you need, um, you need two weeks to go by with no cases. That would be my, you know, again, I, I'm not making the rules, but I'm a, uh, I'm a good doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know that the quarantine is 14 days, so I think you need 14 days in, in an area where you have no cases. And then you can start reopening, and I think you needed to do a staged reopening. Um, I think young people um, and schools would probably be the first to reopen. I think if you reopen schools, then parents are less stressed out and that they can be more efficient at work. Um, I think you probably uh, will be able to open uh, some of the small businesses which have distance, social distancing. Um, we're seeing that some of the restaurants are being open if you can seat people very far away. Although you have to be careful, you have to have good ventilation. I don't know if you saw the study in, in China uh, of a, a closed restaurant that had a fan that kind of um, managed to disseminate SARS within the whole restaurant because there's no question about it, there's some aerosolization. So I think there needs to be staging. I think there needs to be a time of quarantine where you don't see any cases. Thank you. And if you want to hear a great economic analysis, uh, Medical Grand Rounds, Kevin Schulman uh, talked about the economic impact of uh, COVID-19 and it's taped. You go to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds and it was last week. Great, we'll send out the link to that. I'm Emily? here, I'm here. <laughs> Go ahead. Emily? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so Georgia is reopening today and- um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, what's opening? Oh, Georgia, yeah. Georgia. Um, so I was wondering how we can protect ourselves locally or how states can think about uh, protection if order, other states are doing something very different. Um, and I was wondering, yeah, like what are some ideas for that? And do you think restriction and travel between states is realistic? I, I think the harder thing is going to be what's Atlanta going to do, um, which wants to, the mayor of Atlanta wants to keep strict um, <laughs> shelter in place and the outskirts of Georgia are not. Um, so that's a, a, that's a little mini microcosm of what you're asking. You're asking the larger question if uh, red states or some states don't follow shelter in place, how do we prevent them from coming in to um, states that are actually trying to shelter in place? Is that your question? Emily? Emily? Did I lose you? Yeah, sorry, my internet's very bad. So I heard like 80% of what you said, but um, yeah, that's my question about um, states, yeah. blue states, roughly speaking. Uh, I, you know, again, um, I think there probably will be interstate restriction in travel. Um, if, if there's a real hot zone and you don't want people coming in, it's not gonna be restriction, but you can actually do what we did when people were coming in from hot zones. And then when they come into an airport, you can actually quarantine them for 14 days. That would be my suggestion. Great. Um, can you also say a little bit about what are best practices for animal surveillance? Oh, I can say a lot about that. Uh, <laughs> so there is something called the Global Health Security Agenda, uh, which Obama started, which was um, a way that countries that have um, high tech ability to teach countries that don't have that high tech ability to do surveillance. And all you have to do is um, basically bleed animals uh, to do random surveillance of bats, of you know, animals that you think might be carrying new emerging viruses. Um, and we need to strengthen that. The Global Health Security Agenda would take high income countries and ha have them actually train low income countries and give them the, the, mech, the technology to be able to do surveillance of animals. I mean, surveillance of animals becomes so important, not only for spillover, look at what we're seeing with antimicrobial resistance. All of our antimicrobial resistance has to do with us giving antimicrobials to poultry, to, to other animals to keep them healthy. 
Uh, that's where we're seeing the resistance happening. We need to have this concept of one health that we can't be healthy unless our animals are healthy. There's a very large, and, and you can shut me up if I'm talking too much, but there's a very large um, grant that was just given to UC Davis called PREDICT uh, that jo Jonna Mazet is running, uh, which goes out and bleeds animals around the world and does surveillance. But they don't do it. They teach the people in the country how to do it. Okay, great. So, so we'll do um, with four final questions quickly, and then we'll switch over to the to uh, the next speaker, Stephen. Uh, so, Caroline. Hi. Would you be able to comment more on the gendered effects of COVID nineteen that you mentioned briefly? Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this. Not only the fact is why is it that women are doing so much better. Um, and I, I think there are a lot of reasons why women are um, possibly doing better. Um, one is um, we have a much more robust immune system. We know that our immune system reacts to flu vaccine much more aggressively. We know that we have many more autoimmune diseases. Um, so that one reason could be is that our immune system is much uh, more robust. Another reason could be um, that the gendered practices uh, of men. And men tend to seek care much later than women do. Um, they, they, and they may come to attention at a much later, sicker time in the disease. It's well known and well documented. Um, we also know that there are other gendered issues in COVID-19, that women are bearing uh, the majority of the childcare work uh, and I'm actually doing a study now looking at the drop in women authored uh, scientific articles that I got alerted to by Lancet. Um, and they said all of a sudden, uh, first authors that are women have dropped dramatically. So we're actually trying to do a count of that. Uh, there's no question that gendered violence has gone up uh, when you're stuck in a house. Uh, we're starting to see, and they saw that even in China, um, they saw the rate of um, when Wuhan opened up, the lines to get divorced were enormous. <laughs> so, um, and again, when you get divorced, it's women that usually don't have the financial wherewithal um, um, at, at the time of divorce to be as um, um, able to take care of themselves. So there are many, and I've been trying, and if you could think of any more, send me an email, because I am writing this paper and I'm trying to think of all the very nuanced dish, um, nuanced effects that COVID-19 can have on women. Uh, hi, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on uh, the development of a treatment. So I know that yesterday, um, I kind of saw mixed messaging around Gilead's drug, I think uh, remdesivir. So some people were saying it flopped. Others were saying it wasn't like conclusive enough. Shiram, How concerned are you? Yeah, Shiram, yeah. I, think that, I think that was irresponsible reporting. I think we need, okay. to, till, we need to wait till the studies are done. You cannot okay. look, for anybody who's done a randomized clinical trial, you know, mm -hmm. unless there's a huge trend, um, you don't stop the trial and you don't leak messages about something. You need to follow it out. The, it. When, when you do a randomized clinical trial, you, you actually, before you start the trial, calculate the number of people you need to test to see a significant uh, power difference. And while you're watching the trial, there's all these ups and downs. So I don't, you know, that was totally irresponsible about Gilead. Sorry. Okay. I don't think it was Gilead that leaked it, was it? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I can't imagine they would want to leak it because yeah, I, mean, I, I, I got can't. a lot on the line. Because I know the, I, you know, I know the person running the study. Um, Diane okay. Rainer, she's really great, and I can't imagine. Okay, yeah, I was just confused because like some people were saying it flopped, others were saying, oh, it's not conclusive enough. Right. But it's like good to hear because I mean, I guess we all want treatment yeah. developed sooner rather than later. Yeah. Great, maybe a final question from Daniel. Hello, um, I was kind of curious if you could comment on the degree of accountability that China should have uh, with regards to this virus and what type of preventative measures that. Um, like, the, like a global or, or China should take uh, in the future? Well, I'm not going to comment on what China should do in the future. 
Uh, I think this bill in the, in the, first of all, I think calling a virus, the Chinese virus is ridiculous. Um, as I try to explain, I think of us as one planet and these viruses are everywhere and where it erupts um, is, you know, it doesn't mean that the virus came from there. Now, do I think that um, China is somewhat responsible um, when they realize that SARS-1 uh, came from these wet markets? I think that they should ban these wet markets. Um, there's no question when you have so much commingling of animals in a closed space and humans, uh, you're putting people at risk for spillover. So that's one preventive measure uh, that China should be. Um, now, the degree of accountability, I think this idiotic bill in Congress that they want to sue China um, or, or put sanctions on China for uh, holding, I don't, I don't know, for holding back information um, is ridiculous. I think that they, they actually stepped to the forefront and did the genomic testing and gave the genomic testing uh, to WHO. Uh, now, were there some mistakes that China made early on? Yeah. I mean, you don't quiet whistleblowers. You don't, you know, but again, I don't, I don't think that should mandate uh, lawsuits and calling things Chinese. I think um, you, you do need to condemn that, um, but you certainly don't need to put sanctions. I just think you're going to politicize health, and I don't think health should ever be politicized. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for the really wonderful presentation. It's extremely interesting. Okay. And um, we would definitely love to follow up more about the high pass you mentioned related yeah. to the elections and the hand sanitizers. Okay, uh, yeah, I would be great to, uh, and uh, you know, again, um, thank you for inviting me. It's always a yeah, pleasure. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of the students will be interested in that as well. Yeah, okay. Bye, right. guys. Everybody stay safe and everybody vote in November. Great. So we're, me okay? Okay, here we go. Yes, this looks good. We're very fortunate to also have uh, Steve here. So. He's a, he's a professor of epidemiology and public health also at Stanford. And he's going to tell us about a really important topic about the quality of the data reporting. Yes. So uh, uh, anyway, so good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in. Um, I guess I have to uh, mute my phone and everything coming in, all the incoming fire. So uh, uh, James asked me to uh, give this talk, and it was right in the middle of uh, I and my postdoc preparing a paper on the quality of uh, data reporting uh, from all the states uh, on, uh, on COVID. So I thought I would just use that for this talk, because one of the issues with AI and CF is uh, you, know, you, you, you have to get the data from somewhere. And the real message of this talk is, uh, where is that data? What's the quality of that data? Uh, how do you find the data? And who should be reporting the data? Uh, we're gonna, the main focus here is going to be on the state reporting of the data, but we're gonna talk a bit about what data you should be looking for. And um, these are the kinds of questions people ask me. Um, I don't know why they ask me, because I'm not a, infectious disease expert, but these days epidemiologists are expert on everything having to do with COVID. So they ask me, how are we doing? Uh, how do you know? How long will this last? And other lots of, you know, personal questions. Can my kids play with other kids? I'm 55 and healthy. Should I worry? These sorts of things. So the question is, where do you go for the answers for these things? I mean, you can go to PubMed, you can try to find papers, but are there primary data sources that, that help us uh, decide this? Okay, so uh, this is just, uh, you know, when you, in these hostage situations, you know, they, they always say you have to photograph the hostage and with a today's newspaper for proof of life. So here we go. I woke up this morning and here's the front page of the New York Times. So I'm going to talk about, you know, how the states are doing. And there it is right in front of you, how the states are doing. Uh, and so I thought, wow, you know, my, 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 job is done. All you have to, the answer to this question is just look to the New York Times, except you have to be lucky enough to look the, the morning that, um, that it publishes something like this. But we're going to dig, dig deeper here. Um, 
and I'm gonna come back to this page, but this is actually exactly, almost exactly, what we're gonna be talking about. Okay, so first of all, what are the key data to answer those questions? Um, I don't know, uh, James, uh, first of all, I just actually wanna ask James, uh, how much time do we have here? When, when is this supposed to be over? Yeah, so we have, the class has until 11.20. 1120. Okay, I'll try to, try to keep track. Okay, and um, uh, let's see, how do I track if, if students want to answer? Uh, I don't think I can see we this. Will, so we will monitor the chat, the chat box, so they'll okay. type in questions and then uh, we'll pass to you to. Okay, so here, so a few of you submit question, answer to this. What are the key data answer question about how we're doing, uh, you know, when, when we can loosen restrictions? What, what do you think are the key data? Is anybody submitting anything? Ah, I got something up there. Oh, maybe I can't see it. Yes, okay. they're typing the chat box. Yeah, I can't see the chat box. Well, I'm gonna, you can tell me what some of the answers were. What are some of the answers? Serology testing, number of hospitalizations, are not the percent of positive results from testing. Okay. So a couple of those were right, a, a couple of them were, I don't want to say wrong. Uh, testing right now is not telling us anything, it tells us almost nothing. So, and you will find that most of the uh, websites, most of the news reports are about testing. In fact, the um, headlines uh, from yesterday's Los Angeles Times were uh, test, uh, the, the number of positive tests soared past 16,000 which is like a bad joke, because all you have to do is take the number of deaths and multiply it times 100, because the, the case fatality rate is about somewhere around 1%, maybe it's a half percent. So take the number of deaths in a state, multiply it by 100, and that is probably the minimum number of, of cases and infections you have out there. And in the case of, of, of uh, uh, California, that comes out to something on the order of you know, 90,000 uh, infections. So we're gonna get back to that in a minute. But here are key indicators of epidemic direction. And the thing we have to understand is the epidemiologic features of these measures. And, and I'm gonna talk about each of them. So first of all, there's a time dimension. So cases um, are people who become symptomatic. And that's a reflection of infections about a week ago. Hospitalizations, are reflections of infections about two weeks ago. Deaths are reflective about three weeks ago. So it's sort of like light from a star. You know, that, that light that you're seeing, it's not actually what's happening to the star right now. It started like two billion years ago. So that's what's happening when we look at these indicators. We're looking at something that happened, you know, three, one, two, three weeks ago. Now, as, as I'll talk a little bit more about, cases are the most problematic because cases don't, uh, uh, just declare themselves. They, people have to be tested. And I don't know how many students watching have tried to be tested or know people who wanted to be tested, but actually my son is among you. He's an undergraduate. He came back from Spain, study abroad, about five or six of his, his program uh, uh, mates uh, actually got sick, tested positive. Uh, he was the first one to get sick there. He couldn't get tested positive. He couldn't get tested when he came back. Why? Because his symptoms were starting to ebb. So no one would test him. He was still coughing. He had to be isolated at home, just like one of you. Um, but he couldn't be tested. So, you know, testing is actually tough. So the, the, the actual case maps um, are actually, they're more like testing maps. It's just the, mo the more you test, the more you'll find because we're only uh, testing maybe 10%, 5% of the infections out there. We already know that. So anyway, let's get to this. So let's look at uh, some of the percentages, which get to really the question. So we start with infection. It takes about three days to get to being contagious, but about six days, oh, really five to six days to get to symptoms. But only 40%, I'm sorry, about 60% of the total will actually show symptoms. That's very different by age. And then about a fifth of those, we'll go to the hospital and then about a 12th of those will end up dying. 
Now, one of the problems is, and this is one of the problems in answering the questions, is these are hugely different by age and underlying conditions. I'm going to come back to those, which are not controlled in most statistics. And in fact, the issues around some of the gender differences we're seeing in mortality, particularly, where it looks like in, in some data sets, men are 50% more likely or a little less, 33% more likely to die. Some of that may be, as you will see, comorbidities. It may be that they, they have more hypertension, they have more obesity. I haven't seen the age, the, the sex, and, and, and an underlying condition break down simultaneously. Um, but everything Michelle said was right. Um, but the problem is what we also need is data by comorbidities. And many men have uh, untreated or treated uh, underlying conditions. So th this is one more thing about testing. These are actually from Stanford testing data. Uh, these are the, um, the symptoms in order of how frequently they're reported uh, by the, the Stanford, uh, by Stanford, by, st by, by patients who are tested at Stanford. And here you have the probability of that symptom given that you actually ultimately tested positive. And here you have the probability of that symptom given that you tested negative. What you see is many of these things, cough, dyspnea, that is, you know, really in this shortness of breath uh, being febrile, they're not that different in terms of testing positive or not. Uh, being febrile a little bit, that's not bad. Actually, the best, the best discriminator uh, is um, all the way down here, chills, 22% versus only 8%. But what's the problem with this table? So here's a data science table. You, can, you know, this is being aggregated by the data scientists. Why is this, why are these symptoms really not useful to know? The reason is, you have to, for a lot of the Stanford testing, you have to go through a video interview to get tested, just like my son. I guarantee you, if you have uh, one, any of these uh, uh, symptoms, lower uh, symptoms in isolation, you won't get tested. But th what these are, these are the symptoms that get you tested. If you don't have a cough, if you don't have shortness of breath, if you're not febrile, you don't get tested in the first place. That's why there's such poor discriminators over here. So what we're showing is the list of things that get you tested at Stanford, not actually the, the, the frequency of symptoms with COVID. Um, so testing is very, very problematic in the current environment unless testing is done scientifically. So let's go on. So what we did was... I have a question related to that from Daniel. Sure. Yeah, what's the question? Daniel, you want to ask? And answer. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. I guess the question was like, it seems like the issue here is we just don't have enough tests, but if testing was consistent and covered enough people, then the data would actually be helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Once we start doing testing on a scientific random sampling basis, it, it actually doesn't necessarily even have to be enough people. It has to be representative. That's what's key. When everybody says, how do you interpret the, the, sample, the testing data? The first question is, what's the sampling scheme? Who, you know, how did they decide who got tested? If it's a random sample of the population, it does not have to be a million people or 500,000 people. It can be 3,000 people in a county or 5,000. It can be a small number, but it has to be representative. So it's how were they sampled? But that's actually not gonna be the main focus today, although that's gonna be a backdrop. So the answer to the question of how we were doing is trend data. I mean, it seems obvious how we're doing is how we've been doing. And it's trend data in what? It's trend data in, in the things that we, we can sort of rely on, which are hospitalizations and deaths. And that's daily hospitalizations, so new admissions, and, daily, and, and the daily count of deaths. So what we did is we made up a reporting score um, uh, that gave each state a, a score for how well they reported these data. And what we did was we gave you uh, the top box is the hospital with the admissions data and the bottom is the, the uh, death data. And so that we gave more points if you reported as a graphic, that is just as a line. So people could instantly see, you know, the famous curve that we want to flatten. You, you can't flatten curves if you don't have curves. So in the case of hospital admissions, we gave three points if you gave a graphic 
showing all the data, you know, all the trends to this point, and two points if um, they just gave us the data, that is a column of numbers showing it. Uh, for deaths, we gave two points, a little bit less, if they gave us a graphic, and one if, um, if they gave us the data and no graphic. And what you'll see is there is an astonishing, astonishing lack of the reporting of the most basic numbers. And although this is changing rapidly, in the, in the, we abstracted these data in the past two weeks, but in that two weeks, four, four states added, but I'll, I'll get to that. So why did we give more points to hospitals and death? Well, simply because they give you, in, there are many more hospitalizations than there are deaths, fortunately, so it's a more reliable number. And the second part is it gives you that inf information about what happened with infections about a week to 10 days earlier than the deaths. So, you know, we, when we're making public health decisions, speed is everything. So knowing the, 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 the trends in hospitalizations is way more useful than knowing the, the, the trends in death. Because if you wait a week in, 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 in context where, as it was early in the epidemic, that, that, um, that the epidemic was doubling every three days, that's, that's, that's two doubling times a week. So it's no joke. You know, th this time makes a big difference. So, um, and as Georgia opens up and these states open up, we're going to want to know as soon as possible what the health impacts are. So let's go. And um, so this is actually a, a table. I'll orient you to it, but then I'll show you a graphic uh, that shows you what the, what the states are reporting. So this, and then we're going to go to state websites and look and see exactly what we were seeing. So let's see. I want to make sure I have time. Yeah. Okay. So all 50 states. So the denominator here is 50. Okay. So cumulative to date, every state tells you how many cases they've had, how many deaths they've had. Everybody tells you that, the total number. Neither of those are helpful, okay? You will see only 27 of the 50 tells us even the total number of hospitalizations, and, uh, and uh, only three told us admissions. How many told us just daily? This is just that day. Uh, 40, 40 of the states, or 80%, told us how many cases they had that day, and 23 told us how many deaths they had that day. And that's really important, because you're going to see that even though a decent number told you this, which means that the state has these data, they don't present the daily trends. So they have the data, but then the question is, who showed us the trends? And let's go down here. So trend graphics in cases, which are the least informative, 76%, 38 states. In deaths, only 40% of the states showed us lines. In hospitalizations, only 16% uh, of the states, only eight states. And we're going to go into the websites, and I'll show you that. And then we get these issues stratified by age. You get cases, you get not much, you know, less of the deaths. Uh, less of the um, hospitalizations. Age is the most important risk factor. If you don't have these things stratified by age, you don't know what's going on. Stratified by gender, uh, it was for cases, much fewer for deaths, and almost none for hospitalizations. Stratified by race, uh, 33 for cases, so not that good. Less for um, uh, deaths and not at all for hospitalizations. And you're going to see that the comorbidities may be this is the second most important, and yet only two states stratify the cases with their comorbidities, and only four states the deaths. What you're going to see from New York City, we know that not between 98 and 99 percent of the deaths are in people with comorbidities. So it's rather important to know the comorbidities because your chance of dying at almost every age is way, way lower if you if you don't have the comorbidities. Now, of course, the comorbidities, which are things like hypertension, obesity, kidney disease, et cetera, heart disease, go up with age. So those things are tangled up, which is why you have to separate it out. Okay, so let's go to the map. So Steve. this is the map that we developed that shows Steve, the quality one of the slides. Yeah. So the states that do not report hospitalization and other information, is it, do you think it's because they simply don't have that data because it's no. too 
They all have the data. They report it. Everyone reports it every day. But they report it sometimes as just totals to that day. So that's what I was showing. So first of all, they should have the data. So the, the, the states are responsible for being the primary reporters of the data that other people use. And for most of this data, they have it. All they have to do is subtract yesterday from today and put it in an Excel sheet. That's how stupid this is. And I'll show you it in a minute. So this is our map of the quality of reporting. So every state that is in red reports none of the numbers that we said, which is either a trend of death or a trend of hospitalizations of any kind, no data, no line. The ones in yellow are the ones that the maximum score you can get is five, gave us trend graphics for both hospitalizations and death and everybody in the middle and they're variety in the middle. So we're gonna go into the website and I'll show you how this looks. Okay, so here, you might wonder how did the New York Times do this? So let's look on the interior page. This is the interior page. It shows like every state, it's a really beautiful graphic and all data science students should know how to create these sort of panels. But the most important information is right down there at the bottom. Here it is, I'm gonna to have to read it to you because it might be too small on your screen. New York Times database of reports from state and local health agencies and hospitals. Dates for stay at home orders were assembled from state and local uh, and news, uh, state, local governments and local news reports. Population basis uh, estimates are from the census. Data as of you know, basically last night. So they are getting their information from the states. The states just aren't displaying it like this or anything like this. So this is part answer to James' question. All these derivative sites that a lot of computer scientists are putting up, they come from the state health department. And I will also point out that many of these derivative sites actually themselves don't always report the, the critical numbers, but they're much better about it. But, but most people, just citizens, my neighbors, don't know where these sites are. They, don't, they go to the health department. They go to the CDC, which is one of the worst of all. So they don't know that, that you know, Johns Hopkins has a, a, a COVID data tracker, which, by the way, I will show you, does not have all this data either by state. This is why the New York Times, this makes news. Okay, so let's now go back to this. And um, let's, um, uh, let's go to some of those websites. So I'm going to share my screen. It's very dangerous. I'm going to share it for, okay, so let's first of all go to New York State. Okay, can everybody see my, my, uh, yes. Okay, let's go to New York, uh, I'm sorry, New York City. So this is not a state. This is a city. And what's interesting about, and, and I just want to show you what looks good, because New York City provides more data than almost any other place. It's also the place that it has the, by far the most cases and the most deaths. So one of the issues is, can you find the data? Here it's pretty easy if you go to the, uh, the, the New York City site. This is a secondary site. Here's the primary site. So if you go to, uh, let's see, I think you can, yeah, this is, this is when you go to New York City Health, this is what you see. So one of the issues is how easy can, is it to find? So if you just click on this, you go to this page. Then you have to know, it's not so easy. You have to go down to data and then you go into COVID data. So let's click on that. And now we're gonna to start to get some very nice data. So these are the cumulative totals. As I said, those are not so helpful. Here's the number of confirmed deaths and here are probable deaths. So these are the numbers you're hearing, about 15,000 right now. But this is where you start getting nice pictures. So here are the cases. And now it's animated. Here are the hospitalizations. And here are the deaths. Now, one thing interesting, this, this underscores how tricky hospitalizations are. You see there's a drop, 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 drop. Do you think that we're having less cases periodically? Why is it dropping every, why does this look like a sawtooth? Anybody have a guess? It's weekend and people are not testing. Yes. Very smart. It's the weekend. This is Saturday and Sunday. So this just makes my point that the number of cases is simply the number of tests. They're not testing much on weekends. So, 
And I will tell you, and we actually know from just yesterday's release, that these cases represent maybe 5% of the total. We know instantly, instantly from the number of deaths, 15,000, just multiply it by 100. So what is 15,000 by 100, 150, it's 1.5 million. So we know instantly there are probably 1.5 million uh, infections, they're reporting 141,000. So it's undercounted by about 90% at a, at a minimum. So, and we could do, that's just back of the envelope, but that just tells you, you know, this just tells you how much you're testing. But anyway, but hospitalizations, and the other clue that these are not real cases, is that the timing, the peak of cases and the peak of hospitalizations seem to occur around the same time. See, the curve does not really shift over. Hospitalization should be about a week or two later, week and a half, and it's not. But hospitalizations and deaths are hard endpoints. And if I look at deaths, about a week later, you see? Actually, they're not even so hard because there are all sorts of issues with attribution, but we won't get into that. So this is very, very nice. But now down here, now these are rates by age. These are rates standardized for, by the uh, population size. So this is really nice. And you can look at hospitalizations, you can look at deaths. This is really fantastic. What this does show you, by the way, is people under 64 are not immune. There's a fair number of deaths that are happening. In fact, a quarter of all the New York deaths are happening under 64, a quarter. So this, this idea that it's only old people, not true. Here are the rates by sex, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. So the, the men are dying at about, here it, it looks at on a, standardized rate, almost double the women. But then this is really where the, um, the, the most interesting data is, in a, uh, which is, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's the data summary on deaths. This you don't get from any other site anywhere in the country. This is the deaths broken down by age and underlying conditions. See that? And here's the underlying conditions unknown. When you do the math here, 99% of the deaths are in people with underlying conditions at all ages, at all ages, including people 18 to 44. So underlying conditions, what are those? Diabetes, lung disease, cancer, immunodeficiency, et cetera. So I'm not gonna spend more time here, I'm just showing you how informative this site is. It allows you to answer lots and lots and lots of questions. Still not perfect, but um, it's awfully good. So now let's go to, to a, a New York State. Okay, so that's New York City, really great. New York State, let's see what we can find. Okay, so here's the front page. Where's our COVID information? Uh, what you need to know, nothing, 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 nothing. This looks like the end, help stop the press. Uh, look at that, all the, oh, all the way at the bottom, COVID tracker view. You have to know it's there. Okay, so let's look and see what they tell us. Okay, view. So right off the bat, you have no idea the information there. Okay, so this looks really nice, right? So total persons tested, total tested, you know, 35,000, total tested positive, 271,000. Remember, this includes New York City. But do we have any trend data? No. Do we have, is any deaths here? No. So let's say, okay, oh, this looks, this, let's go down here. Well, first of all, let's look for daily trends. So. I said it had no trend data, but here it is. So let's click on that. What do we see? Cases, just tests for the last seven days. And you want more than seven days? That's good. This is cases, only cases, no fatalities, no hospitalizations. So let's go down here and look for fatality data. This is very nice. It's broken down by many things. Do we see any trends? No trends, this is just as of today. Click for trend view, ah, we get back to cases. No trends in, in, in fatality. So we don't even know the daily number of deaths in New York State, and there's nothing on hospitalization. So this is why New York State got a very bad score. So this is what it means to fish around these, these websites. And, and I'm sort of an expert, a, a regular citizen doesn't know what to do. So that's New York State. So New York City is great. New York State, absolutely miserable. And it didn't even have this data until a few weeks ago. 
So let's go to California. Okay, so here we are. Uh, so right up top, so this is very different than New York State, right? Right up top, COVID-19 updates, okay? And there it is, COVID-19 by the numbers. They give us hospitalizations, they give us ICU, they give us total number of confirmed cases, they give us cases up here, fatalities down here. What's wrong with this? So we click on that or we just get a PDF. What's wrong with that? We don't have any trends. Well, we have the total number. And not only that, if you want to download this, it's a graphic. You can't even cut and paste these numbers. You have to write them down by hand. Okay, so let's look down here. So it says they do have race and ethnicity data. So how do you find out um, what the prior numbers were? And actually, they do have a deeper dashboard. You have to download these news releases from each day. Each one has a different picture like this, and you have to write the numbers down by hand. So there actually is a deeper, um, if you go all the way down, they have, okay, the, the um, where is it? There is a, a COVID data website uh, uh, dashboard. I actually can't even find it here, but I think I have it right there. And if you do like two or three clicks, you, you go away from the health department, whoops, and you find this. So it gives you the, the, uh, the trends in depth. Um, so this is good. So we gave them credit for this, even though it was three clicks away. And you saw, I couldn't even find it at that time under pressure of the class. Um, but they do not give you the hospitalization. So California got a, 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 a score of two for this, about four clicks in in a completely mysterious place. So let's just look um, here. This is Washington State. This is actually an example of a good one. So you go to Washington State right up top, novel, uh, you know, coronavirus, and the some of the data is right there on the front page. And you can choose current status, which gives you totals, epidemiologic curves, which gives you deaths here, gives you confirmed cases, where are the hospitalizations. And there are the hospitalizations. Now, this isn't perfect. It does it weekly, but that's not bad. It's not bad, but I would rather daily. And you can get, it's only by week. And that's select all. So we actually gave uh, Washington a five. Oregon, actually, I see we don't have that much time. I'm not gonna go into Oregon too much. They got it too. Um, let's see if I can, uh, what else I wanna show you. Okay. Well, let's. Sorry, the. Uh, would now be a good time to take a few questions, by the way? Yes, now would be an excellent time. Okay, so we've got some questions. Yeah. Um, let's start with Sharon. Uh, yes, sir. Sharon, do you want to speak? Yes, sorry. Um, so I have a question on, um, would it be possible to look at the difference in trends of deaths from previous years and um, extract out the difference or normalize um, those trends to what's being, to extract possibly what could be um, from COVID-19? Yeah, so I, I should have been clear. These are COVID-19 deaths. That's what these are. So what I'm looking for is trends in COVID-19 deaths. Now, that said, what you just, uh, explained what you just described is something that many states are also doing uh, just to look at global health impact, which is that they look at the average in these months uh, of the number of deaths. And that includes everything from auto accidents to, to everything. Um, and they look at how many deaths there are being reported now. And they look at the difference between those curves and they say those differences are the total differences you can attribute to COVID-19. And that's a real population health perspective. That is looking at global number of deaths due to all things. And of course, what's happening now is while we're, you know, while, while we're having uh, many more deaths from COVID, we're having many fewer deaths from, um, uh, from auto accidents and other causes. So it gets a little tricky. Uh, they, can all, they also are looking at this in, for people with flu-like illness because the CDC has a regular monitoring system for flu, and they have the tracking of ILI, influenza-like illness, 
And you can look at the deaths and incidents of, you know, related to ILI, which is just syndromic. That is just a syndrome that looks like the flu. So yes, you can do that, and people are doing that. But these are actual COVID-associated deaths. Now, all that said, a lot of people die and never get tested. They're literally, they're dying in hotels. They're dying in their apartments. This happened particularly in, in, in New York City. Just read about it in today's Times about people who were sent out, tested positive in hotels, and they just died in their rooms, even though they weren't that, that sick. So there's, and, and people... So the, the attribution to COVID is tricky. There are also people who have underlying conditions. And uh, as I say, they may get tested, they might not. Maybe they died really from the underlying condition and they would have died from a bad cold, uh, but that gets attributed to COVID. Um, so the attribution is a little tricky, but, it, you know, but we need to see the data. Michelle has a question. Sure. Oh, Steve. Can you yes, hear me? I, can. Uh, there, I started to write, is there any prospective data on asymptomatic patients? I, know, I don't know if you saw the New England Journal article came out today about asymptomatics in nursing homes. So I didn't see that article. This is the thing about COVID these days. If you're three hours behind, you're, you're, you're less in the dust. So the three hours I was spending preparing this, are the three uh, hours I didn't spend keeping it's up. It's absolutely so, a fabulous talk, fabulous talk. Yeah. Is there, are there any other uh, data on prospective testing uh, so, for symptomatics? So the, um, so I, I don't know it. Uh, obviously there's gonna be lots of retrospective uh, studies done based on the serology. And then we're gonna look going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, I mean, going backward at people who never had symptoms, but they are positive uh, IgG. If you're saying, are, do we have large scale surveillance right now of active infection and, and, and people who are not symptomatic? I don't. Just, I just don't to figure think, out whether there are not is higher than right. one I, you sees. I think we're going to know that uh, when, when we get serial, um, uh, serologic tests, and as you know, some of them turn positive, maybe unreliably, pretty early in the disease. You know, when we get that on a scientific basis going forward in waves, uh, there may be that data right now. I, I don't know. Oh, okay, that. I'm sorry. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning so much. Shaitanya, question as well. Yeah, uh, so like building up on Sharon's question, so uh, like tracking deaths from previous years and comparing it with like after normalizing with the current year, wouldn't that also include some deaths that might not be directly due to COVID-19, but uh, uh, just because like hospitals are getting overwhelmed? Because I read somewhere that in Spain, uh, hospitals are prioritizing, uh, like are giving least priority to uh, uh, people who are like 80 plus for ICU uh, preferences. Yes. yes, well, what... The key number, I, I just one thing I have not said here yet, but the really key number, the only thing we can really, um, and, and one of the most important numbers that everybody wants to know is once infected, what's the probability of dying? If nobody died from COVID, nobody would care. We would not be shut down. So it's the, it's the fear of death from the spread of the infection that's really driving everything we're doing right now. There are many things that affect that. One is age, one is comorbidities, and the third uh, is the ability for the healthcare system to care for these people properly. So for example, in, in, in New York City, maybe if those three people, you know, those folks who were being farmed out to, hop to hotels were in the hospital, they wouldn't have died. In Italy, we know absolutely for sure that there were people who died because they could not get the proper care in the hospitals and they were running out of ventilators, everything. So when you look at the death rate per infection, which probably is a little less than 1%, but much higher than that as you get older or have underlying in infections, um, that clearly goes up in systems that are overwhelmed. So it's probably closer, I mean, the. The case fatality rate and the what's called the infection fatality rate are two very different things. And this is 
why the death data, reliable death data is so important. Also hospitalization, so we get a sense of, of how serious the, pa the cases are that are going into the hospitals. You can back out the numbers and, and figure that out. Like what percentage of people who are infected are going into the hospitals. We know what that should be, um, but if it's too low a number, then we know that there's lots of people who are seriously ill that are not getting into the hospital. So the issue of the hospital saturation is one of the central issues because in fact, we may not be able to stop uh, the entire, you know, a huge proportion of the population from getting COVID over a long period of time if we don't get a vaccine. But what we wanna do is keep it at a, a dull roar so that the, the full resources of our healthcare system can be devoted to every patient and nobody's turned away um, who, who might need help. And it's particularly important for COVID because it seems that there's this phenomenon where people seem to have a plateau phase, some of them, and then they deteriorate incredibly fast, incredibly fast. And if they're in a hospital, they can be saved, but if they're not, uh, they, they meet an untimely end. So I guess that's all I'll, I'll say with that. But the issue of what the actual fatality rate is, both per case and per infection. I have one slide here, which shows that how it differs uh, among cities. Uh, it, it differs pretty dramatically among cities in New York, it's pretty high. The, the systems where uh, the, they were overwhelmed, Detroit and New York are much higher. And these are case fatality rates, that is people who are identified as having COVID, not infection fatality rates, which includes the silent cases. So it's, infection fatality rates are by definition at least half. Uh, of the case fatality rates, because about half of people have minimal symptoms. Okay, thank you. There's a related question from, from Major about indirect fatalities. Yes. Yeah, so I'm curious about, is there any people looking at indirect fatalities? Things like, you know, malnutrition due to loss of income, unsupervised kids doing dangerous activities, um, people are reluctant to get in hospital for other conditions, lack of emergency yeah. response for other stuff. So I know for a fact that uh, the Santa Clara Health Department is really, really worried about that. And they are starting to monitor that. Um, they're developing a task force specifically on that. There have been uh, a few academic studies starting to look at that. Uh, that obviously wasn't the very, very first uh, uh, thing out of the box, but now people are paying very serious attention to that now as the economic uh, costs uh, mount. And it, it's very, very important to, to recognize that, that this is not deaths from COVID versus nothing. This could be deaths from COVID versus deaths from the shutdown. And as this goes longer and longer, there are gonna be more people dying just from the shutdown. That is, there could be an increase in suicide. There could be an increase of cancer deaths because cancer care is interrupted. And exactly as you say, people who don't go to the hospital with heart attacks or with you know, symptoms that suggest. So we're gonna have to start, the, the overall public health, health impact of the response is something we're gonna have to, we are just starting to. We're gonna have to pay very, very serious attention to. It's not just dollars versus lives. Increasingly, it's going to be lives versus lives. Will it be as many lives as the COVID uh, could claim? Probably not, but it's, it's a serious consideration and you, you, measure the, you measure health impact not just by lives, but by suffering. And actually, the, another thing I should have mentioned about COVID that, that gets lost is, and, and Michelle maybe can speak to this, is that it looks like this virus causes organ damage in severe cases, lung damage, kidney damage, heart damage. So even people who don't die are actually, there's some proportion that are very severely affected and we don't know the long-term consequences of COVID. It's not just death. It's not like a, you know, in some ways, not like a bad flu where it does seem like that doesn't cause, as I'm not an infectious disease doc, doesn't cause as much peripheral organ damage outside of the lungs. I'm not even sure how much permanent lung damage that causes, but COVID looks like it does. So that's also what makes it quite different from the flu. And Michelle, you're, you're watching, can you just either say yes or no, no I, or am I, I right I, about that? No, I totally agree. Um, we're seeing now um, permanent lung damage. Um, yeah. We're certainly seeing myocardial damage. We're seeing strokes. Um, we're seeing kidney 
um, even progression to hemodialysis. And this is not something we usually see with flu. Um, right. I mean, you can get acute myocarditis and chronic <clears throat> pain of the heart right. with the acute illness, but this is the chronic um, sequelae of, of right. it. It's a very nasty virus. Yeah. So this is actually being missed by most of the, the current statistics and the comparisons with the flu, which just look at infection fatality rates, miss this whole other picture. They also miss the fact that probably eight to ten, 10 times more people are susceptible to this virus than ever get the flu uh, because there's lots of cross reactivity in the flu and obviously there's flu vaccine. So the entire country does not get the flu, but the entire country could get this. And so even yeah. if they were, mm -hmm. I, and Steve, one other point is, and I just wrote a, a piece in CNN, CNN picked up, is the hidden death rate of all the non-communicable diseases of people being afraid to come into the hospital. The heart Yeah, I mentioned that, right. Uh, maybe you were looking at an email. I, I said that, yes. Sorry. And, and that's absolutely a big part of this. Um, um, so that's what I was saying, that, that, that we have to start looking at total, total death rates. And that's why I'm saying it's lives versus lives. It's not just lives versus money. Uh, but we absolutely have to get this, these data uh, in shape so people know uh, what's going on. And the other part of it is that these shutdowns depend on people cooperating. So that's to be complete transparency, really good communication, communication, communication. And part of these data, yes, you can dig them out if you have a team of reporters. But if the state is not reporting the data clearly and people understand why they're doing what they're doing, you won't get acceptance of this. It's, and already people are getting very tired of it. So the, the, the role of the health department is to explain why we're doing what we're doing. So you absolutely need the critical data there in front of everybody. And without that, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, both a health problem and it's a political problem. Daniel has a question. Yeah, so I wanted to ask, um, so what are hospitals currently using to report their COVID uh, data? And have there been any attempts to either centralize this data reporting or some sort of algorithm to parse through EHR data in order to pull out COVID data, comorbidities, um, and this other information? Uh, the answer to that is, um, it, I think it varies by state. Um, and, and the Right now in, in California, you saw their top line, top line hospitalizations. They are required to report these hospitalizations. I don't know if that's true in every state. There is a CDC um, guidance on how to fill out death certificates for, for COVID um, uh, deaths. But interestingly, they don't have a guidance. And actually, I, I published a commentary just a, a month, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, in, in a in a political in, on the Hill, that's a, actually a publication, the Hill, uh, saying that the CDC should put out a guidance for how states should gather and report this information. I don't have an answer to your question of is there a network of hospital hospitalization reporting in every state. Um, I don't know that. I think it's a, the thing about uh, public health is it's radically decentralized. It's decentralized all the way down to the level of county. The, the, the state often aggregates the county uh, report. So every county has to do this. And there's certain required reporting and there's other non-required reporting. And I don't know about hospitalizations. Um, and I'm sure there are algorithms that people are trying to do it. But what I would say is we shouldn't have to resort to that. Um, so it, it clearly is different by state in terms of how they report it, whether they have all the information and they have the information infrastructure in place for the hospitalizations. I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, but this again goes back to issues around public health information infrastructure, which is part of I, presumably what you're learning in this class. It's very underdeveloped. It is very un, underfunded. We shouldn't be trying to build this capacity, you know, in the face of a pandemic. Um, and, and, and it's all being exposed right now, what underinvestment means these poor county and state health departments are every year cut, 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 cut. And in order to have this information, you need a person. You just, it's simple as that. You need a person who goes out and gets it and displays it. Sometimes it means if, if, the, if the hospitals are not reporting to you, 
that you have to call the hospital. I know they, that had to occur for several counties around here, and there was a very good uh, San Francisco Chronicle report on the very um, uneven reporting of hospital data, but the health department needs somebody to go get it. And when they're cut, those sort of people go away, and then we have a pandemic, and there's no capacity to do it. So this is what infrastructure, information infrastructure means. It's not just software. It's actual people being there to, um, to gather the data. Can we do some of it automatically? Maybe, but those algorithms aren't going to be great. So it, there's no reason why we haven't, shouldn't have it set up and, and very easily um, aggregated. I see. Thank you. So maybe just a couple of final questions from students. Uh, Rob? Yes, so, uh, so potentially different virus strains can have different impact in terms of the fatality rate and in terms of the uh, longer damage. So what's our latest uh, kind of understanding in this area? What, what's, what's the latest? So I'm not really the expert on that. I do know that there have been some uh, mutations, variations uh, in this virus. Um, you know, some from a, you know, uh, sort of characteristic strains that seem to come uh, more from Europe and others that seem to come from Asia, or, or at least from, from where they first came. Uh, I don't know if we have a good handle on whether they actually have different mortality patterns. Uh, I, if that data is out there, I just don't know it. Maybe Michelle knows it. That's much more in the virology sphere. Um, Michelle, do you have we to know we that? Don't, we don't know that. There's been very few small mutations, so it's unlikely. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that that's playing the big role. I, I will say whatever role that changes in the virus are playing right now, I think issues around who gets it and who's protected, I mean, are, are much, 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 much bigger. You know, the, 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 the differences according to hospital saturation, according to race, according to access, these are hugely greater than maybe subtle differences due to the virus right now. That may have an impact on vaccine and immunity, though. Um, and we'll find out, you know, that, that we, we have that experience with flu. There are many different strains of flu. Whether the vaccine that will be developed will be equally effective against every, every strain of COVID, we'll have to see. It depends on exactly what the vaccine is targeting. So, um, so, but that's speculative. I'm, I'm not the expert on that. We actually have a group of students working on projects that are looking at uh, exactly that question of uh, different strains of virus and impact on selection and immunity. So hopefully they can tell us in the research update next week. So that would be great. I will just say, you know, just the overarching thing is you guys are seeing science in the making. This, this underscores how science is not a collection of facts. It's a slow, slow accumulation of lots of little facts. And we're seeing it happen right now. Michelle talked about a paper this morning. There'll be a paper tomorrow morning. There'll be a paper the next morning. Every one of these, this, this is science. This is science, what you're seeing right now. And the questions we can't answer today, we'll have better answers in two weeks or in two months. So the, this is what makes science exciting. It's sort of a gigantic worldwide laboratory in how facts are created. Uh, and they, they are not facts that are just you read in books. They're facts that are created every day by scientists and people like you right now. So I can't wait to see what you find. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. The students also ask if there's a draft of your paper that you mentioned that might be available soon. Uh, well, all I can say is uh, <laughs> JAMA is looking at it right now. <laughs> and uh, we'll see if, if they don't take it. Uh, so I can't share it right now. But we didn't put it on a preprint server. Uh, maybe we should have. Sometimes that gets you into trouble. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for the, the very interesting presentation. Um, thanks to both you and Michelle for joining the class today. This is really helpful. Well, thanks for having us. It's been, been a pleasure. I hope you guys had a good time.